Farm for Profit Podcast. Take a listen, have a blast. Farm for Profit Podcast. Learn about farming while having a laugh. Farm for Profit Podcast. Okay, so now the much requested topic of agritourism. This is going to be another fun conversation. You know, I think I say that almost at the beginning of every conversation that we have. That's because you take all the requests. I, that's right. I know. It is, it's so much fun to get. I was just telling Diane before this as to how we came about finding her and the topic. But we're talking agritourism. So this is a request because there's so many social medias, Instagrams, TikToks that you see of pumpkin patches and sunflower mm-hmm. farms and come here to do my chores for me type operations that – Everybody's curious, do they really work? And how do I get it started? So we've got Diane Weingarten, and what a better last name than mm-hmm. to maybe I'm just going to host <laughs> a wine garden on my farm. But she is highly respected educator from right here from the best college in the state, let alone the nation, Iowa State University. So she is a community leader here, dedicated much of her career to serving as an extension educator with Iowa State University Extension. She has worked tirelessly to provide educational resources, which we'll talk a little bit about today, but focused her efforts on helping agritourism farms thrive, recognizing their critical role in promoting sustainable agriculture and boosting local economies. So that's what we're talking mm-hmm. about, guys. You excited about this? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's, that's a big thing around here. <laughs> it is. Welcome to the podcast, Diane. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So let's start off first. I gave a high level of who you are. Why don't you talk about your story as to how you got to this position? Well, I've been working with tourism in general for a number of years. I started with communities. I was downtown chamber director, Main Street director. More and more people said, we need to bring more visitors to our town to boost our local economy. So eventually I became involved with Iowa State University and they asked me if I would become more involved in tourism, become the tourism specialist through ISU Extension and Outreach. And so that was about 20 years ago and been working now. And now, as you mentioned, agritourism has become a very popular trend across the nation and, Mm -hmm. of course, as in Iowa. And so we are now turning some of our resources towards focusing on agritourism and how we can develop more farms to provide this to Iowans and to the nation because they are indeed really asking for more of these options. Tanner, I think when we had the... uh, um uh, other ways to make income on your farm podcast. That's right. uh, the more and more people thought about uh, different ways we, the dairy farmer and creameries, and we've had a lot of people that have done. Yeah, because we've talked. maybe a side side hustle that turned into agritourism as their main hustle. That's true. Let's see how many of those we can think of. So we had Andrew Blake with Blake's Hard Slide, Blake's Hard Cider on mm-hmm. New York they, Farm Girls, New York Farm Girls. Uh, they've got a pumpkin patch and a an on farm bar. Correct? Yeah, like a brewery. Yeah, almost. They do like a Friday night on the farm thing or yeah. something like that. Yeah, we talked to uh, who's the guy that was a comedian. Yes, uh, T. R. Jones. Yep, they're the ones with the creamery, Richland Family Dairy, uh, or Richland Family Creamery. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that we've talked to. Well, even to the point of growing corn. Tony Reed is technically gives tours of what a planter looks like and what mm-hmm. uh, what a tractor sprayer looks mm-hmm. like. Even uh, corn, pork, and beans. What? Corey <laughs> gives tours through social media. What about not necessarily the, the one that has a camper that you can go out? Oh, well, that's right. Harvest host. Harvest host. Yeah, you can yep. go out and take a camper to yeah. a farm. So, Diane, we've talked a little bit, uh, not necessarily focused on it. So today we right. get to focus on it. So what if someone asked you, what is agritourism? There are many different definitions, but the most widely accepted definition is agritourism businesses provide engaging and interactive experiences in a rural setting. So that pretty much opens the field to a wide range of opportunities. And as you were discussing, would you guys just come along with me next time I have a client meeting? Because they're looking for (laughs) ideas. Well, just listen to these guys. They can just fire off a whole bunch of ideas. That's the goal. Hopefully, you can repurpose (laughs) this episode. And you can say, just go to listen to Farm for Profit, episode number, ooh, I wonder if it's going to be like 290, something like that. You know, she she just said in an agriculture purpose, but, you know, an experience. You and I were just at a fundraising gala for the local hospital, and I was the auctioneer on this. And 
the the board asked me, hey, could you sell this hog? Well, we sell you know half a beef for a hog all the time, but this is not that. This was go butcher the hog on your own, oh. and they will work through the whole process. And they used the word butcher, and I said, how about harvest instead of the word butcher? And they said, nope, nope. The family told us we need to say butcher yeah. is what you're going to do. And it sold. I was thinking, we're not going to get a bid. This is going to be $300 or $200. And it was like $1,500 somebody wow. gave for the experience to go. Uh, they, they get the meat as well, but yeah. they're going to take it through the whole process of what it's like to harvest a hog on the farm, which I thought, no way. Nobody's buying this experience. A bunch of doctors, and sure enough, it sold like hotcakes. But then again, a bunch of doctors. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> See, you just proved my point when I say that tourism examples are limited only by the imagination. And apparently Iowans have some pretty creative <laughs> imaginations. <laughs> I think 10 years ago, if you would say Iowa agritourism, most people would envision pumpkin patches and yes. corn mazes. But we need, and those are important assets. They continue to be, but we need to look beyond the pumpkins. We're looking at things like tours, festivals, unique dining experiences in all kinds of crazy settings and fun <laughs> settings. Um, things such as outdoor recreation, bed and breakfast, and a really popular new trend in agritourism are unusual types of overnight stays in a rural location. Like bed and breakfast type? Like bed and breakfast. I'm um, working recent, currently with a new client. They bought a property and it had an old corn crib, the round metal corn crib oh, on yeah. it. And they were they were newly married, a young couple, and they said, well, this would make a great tiny house. So they reconverted, actually, he's a design of architecture alum from Iowa State University. So I thought I could make a cool home out of this corn crib, and he did. And he thought, well, maybe this could be a side income. As you just mentioned, he said, maybe, you know, this is kind of developed into a nicer project than we were thinking of. It might be rustic. Yeah. It was not rustic. It was a very nice finished interior. Maybe people would be willing to rent our tiny house on a mm -hmm. weekend, and we could stay with relatives and get some additional income. It turned out that they, their response was wildly over what they expected. <laughs> and so now it is full-time Airbnb, and they cannot keep dates open for people who want to come. They book a year in advance. Sure. It's so wildly po And it's out in the middle of nowhere. So people are looking. Airbnb actually contacted our state tourism office, and they said since COVID, people became introduced to the outdoors, to the rural setting, and to Iowa. And we just do not have an inventory in stock in Iowa. Can you generate, help create more overnight stays in rural settings in I Iowa? I hadn't thought about that. So do you think COVID has driven growth in the agritourism industry? All indications show that it has specifically in agritourism and especially in overnight stays. Corey, how many grain bins you got? <laughs> well, oh, he said we have a row of 10 government grain bins in a row. 30,000 yeah. bushels or 35,000 bushels. And I've seen campgrounds. People take that row of government grain bins, and they have literally turned them into cabins or condos, and it's now a, a campground. You, you, the only problem you've got is where they sit. They're going to smell hogs all the time. No, no, no. That's, no it's that's up the to experience. the imagination. This you have to do experience. hog chores as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, you know? he has an imagination, and that's, right? what, that's what it takes. One, right? I thought of was somewhere in eastern Iowa, too. They had a silo, and in the wintertime, they flooded it with ice. Over it, and they had ice climbing on it. Have you ever seen that? I've one? seen that one. Yep. Oh, I've seen I haven't heard one. of it for a while. Maybe they quit, but that, sure. that was kind of a cool one. So how do you identify what the unique selling point is? Is it just your imagination and say, hey, this is going to go? I mean, we want to make money at this. So how do we, as our listeners, if they have an idea, how do they know it's good? Well, they can identify what type of customer they want or what they can offer. And we actually, research indicates that there are five primary categories of agritourism customers. And in fact, we've created nicknames for them. Do you, are you interested? You <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 That's, right. That's your game. Yeah. The first we call the explorers, and these are people who want to learn about new things. They're driven by curiosity, and they come to an agritourism destination because they think that they're going to learn something new. They may like to learn by doing. They may like to feed that baby calf a bottle. Right. They may like to learn how to make 
make pizza with a wood fired oven. So those are the explorers. So agritourism businesses who meet that niche and they provide education, in, especially in a hands-on way, they can have a really large customer base of who we call the explorers. Mm -hmm. The next ones are the experience seekers. They are people who are looking for fun and especially different types of things to do. And they may be completing a bucket list, or it could be that they just want um, something that they can brag about. A lot of them are the social media posters. They want something they can take a selfie in a really unusual setting or doing something that is something that no one else in their group has done before that they can brag about. I often hear of people in this group say, oh, I can't wait to get back to Rotary and tell them about what I did <laughs> this weekend. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. If you see selfie uh, places set up at different attractions, those are for the experience seekers. So they are the social media aficionados, the gurus. They really want to prove that they've been there and done right. that and are, are doing these unusual experiences. There are a third category we call the facilitators. Now, they do not go necessarily to attractions for their own purpose or for their own interest, but to provide these experiences to others. others. Maybe their children, their grandchildren, their friends. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just coming along with their spouses who want to do this. And sometimes agritourism operators overlook them like, oh, they're just along for the ride. However, if they were not willing to come along, Correct. probably the rest of the visitors would not be there. So they're pretty important. They often help facilitate, make sure that the other visitors get there and then they can go along and they can promote you to other families who might be interested right. as well. The fourth category we call the hobbyists. Those are people who have personal interests and they feel a close connection perhaps to your agritourism site because it matches their own interests. Maybe they're coming just to get some creative ideas of something they can do in their own backyard or in their own home or in their own kitchen. And these visitors, often like to try workshops. You mentioned workshops. They might like to try some of the workshops that you offer. And it's really important to welcome these people because they could become your best promoters and they could be your future volunteers that come and just assist you with hmm. your business. And the last category we call the rechargers. They simply wish to rejuvenate, relax, refresh, they may want to commune with nature or interact with animals. And they enjoy peace places like gardens, peaceful places. They especially like water features. So if you have an opportunity to add that, or if that's an audience or customer that you want to attract, consider providing a place for the rechargers. And once you identify your primary visitor, then you can cater to that customer and you can make sure that you offer opportunities, classes, the kind of elements that they are most seeking. And also, likewise, you can market. You can find out where do they hang out, what kinds of mm. things do they like to do, mm -hmm. and that's your best target marketing Corey, opportunities. I got a story for you. So okay. just where we were just going with this, the number four style that wants a webinar or, or a, a experience, a class. Workshop, right? Yep. They can stay in your government bins, but I had a Facebook. You never know what you get at the auction world. Well, I had a Facebook guy come to pick up a stove, a kitchen stove yesterday. And him and his girlfriend are from New York. And they came to Iowa for a stove? And they didn't, they were moving to Iowa. Oh, they're oh, in oh, Iowa. Geez. And they came with a little trailer and a little car. They come out to my farm, and I had to move my tractor out of the way and uh, get in the shop. And they go to load this, and they said, can you help us load it? And I said, well, i got a dolly right here. Yeah, we can load it up. Yeah. Pretty simple. So we loaded it on their trailer, and they're like, wow, what do you call that thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, that's a, a dolly, you know, and they'd never, never moved anything, which blows my mind. Okay. And then, so I like, I, so did you sell them the dolly too? <laughs> no, I didn't. But what, it, what, it, what I went to is they got to strap this thing down. I'm like, this will be interesting. Oh, See boy. how they strap this down. And the girl says, well, I got one of those strappy things, a ratchet strap. Yeah. Oh, I'm and surprised they had one. I thought he should have listened to her, but he didn't. He's like, ah, 
I got a rope. That ain't going anywhere. And so <laughs> he starts tying this thing down with like a 200-foot rope. And I mean, <laughs> they went back and forth and back so and forth. So he built a cargo net over the and top built of this a cargo thing. net over this thing. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm going to give you a class. You should listen to your girlfriend. One ratchet strap would have done the Wait, whole how thing. How was his knots? You're a firefighter. Oh, he, did he, he have some good knots? He was explaining to his girlfriend the entire time how he was doing the knots. <laughs> and so I was like, I need, there, it made me think of that. I need to give a class on Sounds how to like strap. maybe they took some different classes. <laughs> In New York, on some. He should have paid attention to the way we strap our equipment down on road trips to trade shows. You just need bungee cords. Oh, just yeah. need bungee yeah, cords. Just Tanner <laughs> with bungee. Tanner would have a cargo net of bungee we're, cords. We're going to give a class on how to strap equipment to a trailer. <laughs> oh, well, back to the agritourism <laughs> yes. side of things. <laughs> yes. So I got one thinking in my mind. There's one on the south side of Des Moines, Rose Farms, very good friends of mine. I feel like they fall into every category. Like they, they do workshops. Yeah. They have a bed and breakfast now. They have a thing that you can come out and cut your own flowers and do all that. Like do do many people fall into all the categories? It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And and that's very helpful to diversify because in, then, of course, you can generate income year-round. Mm -hmm. So that is a goal of many agritourism mm -hmm. operators that they up for classes so that they can – have generate income beyond the growing season. So you just named several ways that people is, can diversify. Is there an asso there's an association for everything? Surely there's a group of people that's like an agritourism association where they can get ideas, help. There are associations. There are national associations. There are local agritourism associations, and. It would be remiss, remiss of me if I did not mention that Iowa State University has an agritourism dedicated website. It's called Visit Iowa Farms. Hmm. And if you want information, checklists, resources, things like how I can get permits, how I can get different connections for things I might want to do, or just to get a, just generate some ideas, I suggested you check the website. And you can list your own agritourism business on there hmm. free of charge. It has a cool feature. You can type in either a county or a type of agritourism business, and it lists all of the Iowa okay, agritourism businesses in that category. And I just quickly want to mention something. If, if you're interested, if you are an agritourism business and you're concerned about liability, we now offer via that website oh, really? a free online risk management Class. Again, it's free of charge, and it's called Risk Management Education for Farmers by Iowa State University. Very easy to find. Visit Iowa Farms, search Risk Management Education for Farmers by Iowa State University. And if you complete it within the allocated timeline, you get a certificate for that. So, guys, we're farm for profit. We're going to talk about being profitable for just a second. And it, when I think of Corey going to till up ground and make, you know, t take all of his time and move it over here to agritourism rather than production agriculture or have uh, part of his family, his, his brothers or uh, brother and his wife or something, do a separate entity, the juice has got to be worth the squeeze. So I, I'm assuming um, what I'm thinking in my head is like CRP programs. I'm thinking wildflower programs. I'm thinking uh, government payment assistance. How many people have government assistance on their agritourism, do you think? Mm, that's a good question because there are government programs that, like you stated, if you can get a field of sunflowers rolled into a CRP or a nature preserve or a wildlife uh, habitat program, you could probably benefit off of that. Now, you do have to pay attention to, especially when you look at CRP rules, that you can't be in it, on it, mow it during a certain time frame mm. to where uh, there could be a little bit. No. Well, I was thinking of Blacks out here, uh, Seed yeah. Farm, and they did the deal, cut the sunflower deal. I'm like, who's going to pay to cut a sunflower? <laughs> Everybody paid to cut <laughs> a sunflower. <laughs> I'm like, um, they probably got paid for the sunflowers on some kind of sure. pollinator program and made money on the backside having people cut it and take a picture with it. Actually, you pick flowers is one of the fastest growing agritourism businesses right now. It's a quickly grow fast growing sector of the agritourism market. Hmm. So you mentioned early on you wanted us to come join you on some of these meetings yes. that you put together. Yes. What what does a meeting like that look <laughs> like? So if you've got a new listener, right. just learned about you, they mm -hmm. call up, they set the meeting. What goes on in those meetings? What are we talking about? Depends what they what they want from me. Okay. Often they just want to know, I have an idea. I have a concept. Yep. Will this work? I can't 
promise it what they will do because a lot of it depends on the operator as mm -hmm. each of you know but i can give them examples of probably where something similar is happening if not iowa in another part of the country and they can connect with that person and they can ask questions of that operator directly also i can give them advice on some things that i know are successful that's similar to what they're suggesting right now that maybe they want to consider or ways they can tweak it that maybe would add extra value to what they're considering i also ask each new potential agritourism operator to consider the three P's of agritourism. We talk about the three P's of business, but agritourism, the P's are a little bit different. You want to know what the three P's sure, are? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. The first one is to be successful as an agritourism operator, you have to have passion. You must love what you do. Why should a visitor want to come to you if you look like you don't even care about what they're coming to see. Right. And passion is contagious. Your passion flows from you to your visitor and flows from your visitor to the other people they tell about mm -hmm. you and into them so that they can tell other people about you. So you must have passion. The second P is personality. You are the face. Most of these are small businesses. You must have the face of your business. And do you have the personality to interact with the public so that they want to come back again after meeting you? Mm -hmm. And the third P is perseverance. Life happens, especially in agritourism and especially in Iowa because that's where severe weather happens. And Mother Nature can be an unforgiving <laughs> business partner. Hey, amen. <laughs> so can you push ahead regardless of the weather and regardless of what else happens? Now, the Three Ps, passion, personality, and perseverance. If you are a sole operator, you must have all three of these to be successful. But if you are a family farm or a small business and you can hire employees, then you need to decide who is the lead role for each of these so that you, together as a team you can become successful. Right. I'm thinking of a lot of farmers. They might like the idea of this because it profitability, right? That's what mm -hmm. we were about, like, Sounds profitable to have a pumpkin patch or an apple orchard or whatever because there's a lot of people there. But then I also think a lot of us are kind of farmers because we don't like to work with a lot of people <laughs> and have a lot of people up in our business. So maybe it might be smart to hire that right person or get a spouse or, you know, some family member to kind of head that up. <laughs> Absolutely. This guy told me once, you want to win the Super Bowl, he says you might not be the quarterback. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Yeah. That's hard to take. But it, as soon as you can give that rein up, but and, yeah. and do what you do best, I think you'd fly. So now as you've seen a lot of businesses start and some be successful, what what are the first challenges or hurdles that are that you might be able to give our listeners a heads up on? Something that new agritourism businesses often don't think about, are you ready for company? Mm. That window in your barn that's been broken for a long time, you may not even see it anymore. But if a visitor comes on your farm, they are going to notice that, yeah. and that's not a good first impression. I think of our scrap pile. <laughs> <laughs> needs to be hauled to town. Yeah. I often travel to other states and try to get cool new ideas and bring them back to Iowa. And sometimes I also bring back examples of what not to do. Yes. And my most recent agritourism experience, and this was not in Iowa, it was in another state, was one of those what not to do examples. Hmm. And people often don't think about this, but you really need to. Am I really ready for company? And you need to pay attention to details. Details are very important. Um, in this example, I was with a motor coach group and we did an agritourism tour and the lunch was a stop at a farm that was just new in the industry and we were one of the first groups that they've hosted and we we're going to stop and have lunch we got off the motor coach they handed us a plate in one hand a cup with a drink in another hand and they said enjoy your lunch well there, there were no tables or chairs for our lunch and this is what we thought you could just sit on our backyard <laughs> well i need to mention here that we shared this backyard with a large flock of free-range chickens <laughs> <laughs> And there was no spot on that yard that had not already been visited by a chicken. By a chicken. <laughs> that was not only a disgusting experience, but it was a potential food safety issue. Mm -hmm, sure. And so 
if we were, if I, if that was my client, I'd advise either the meal or the chickens need another location on this farm. This is something that would be very valuable to have other visitors do a premier experience with you before you start bringing visitors onto your farm. People who have fresh eyes and candid comments to let them know what maybe you should be doing directly differently than what you are offering right now because details really do matter. There's your sixth <laughs> group of uh, people that oh. visit farms is, that, is, is that? other people that want to be or why don't we just start start that? That'll be our new hobby. Is we'll be we'll be yeah, we agritourism the world. testers. <laughs> testers. <laughs> <laughs> Australia, here we come. <laughs> That's hey, right. You, you mentioned uh, food safety. Is there a lot of red tape or you know stuff that comes along with? Good question. With yeah. this, because I, I know a little bit because I did I grew aroni berries. For several do you years. really? I did. I, not anymore. I have two now. <laughs> two, plants. Two, two, two berries. Two berries? Two, two plants. <laughs> I had 15 acres. I don't anymore. But I, I do remember the people that were developing that, and they had to get, um, oh, what is it, approved kitchens or... Um, Licensed license, ch- kitchens, yeah, yes. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Again, if you go to the Visit Iowa Far- Farms website, Iowa State University, it tells you about the different food safety, different trainings that we offer different licenses or types of kitchens that you need depending on the type of foods you offer. Right. Same with like liability, like someone gets hurt on your farm on a tour, like is there insurance for that? Oh yes, there is. And in (laughs) fact, we have a link of many insurance companies who you can contact regarding that. And two years ago, the Iowa State Legislature realized that, hey, this is a commodity that we're not tapping into fully because many of them were worried about that the liability Hmm. factor. So the Iowa legislature then did limit liability in certain conditions for uh, agritourism operators, and we're very thankful to them for doing that, and that's very helpful. What, is there a list of bankers that would loan me money when I want to build something like this, too? Because not every banker is going to take me serious. I if, think you need to talk to the person sitting yeah, next I, that's to you. That's, the, uh, are you on this list, I Tanner? do wonder that because banks won't give you the, money for stuff that's not Well, like proven, when you went to do Aronia right? Berries, it was probably a lot harder to, I didn't to, get a loan. to sales pitch that. Tanner looked me straight in the eye and said no. That's what I'm saying. So, so from my experience and just from my position, this would be a very difficult loan product for me to put together yeah. because because of multiple factors. Corey hit one. It's a new endeavor with no historical performance. The third one, or the second and third one, have to do with hospitality and food safety. So that even if you're just running a standard steakhouse, a standard restaurant, those are even difficult loans to get and obtain in the traditional fashion. Now, if you're trying to do farm to table, serve and cook food and the liability that comes with that on your own business Mm -hmm. takes it one step higher Then the hospitality side, just because the times that we're in when COVID hit hospitality plummeted. And if you had a large concentration of hospitality on your books, your bank hurt. So it's just one of those fresh memory things that probably makes this very difficult. Now the, what would be beneficial is if you have a farm, and you have farm ground, that's one of the most secure forms of collateral. So if you're willing to pledge other assets and go about financing your endeavor that way, then you're probably going to get it taken as a uh, consideration at least. Do, do most of the people that you meet with, uh, Diane, do they, do they have money and an idea? Or are, are they already in agriculture and have an idea? Or are they new, younger folks that say, I want to get into agriculture, I have an idea? Yes, to all of the above. Okay. Again, it's limited only by the imagination and what, they, what they're inspired to do. Okay. Right. Now, I, I can't pass up this opportunity to let Corey know about a special opportunity he can have that we are going to be offering coming up. And it features one of the stops is an Aronia Berry Farm. I saw that on here, yeah. <laughs> Is this something I could share a little bit about? Absolutely, yes. So we received a grant from Iowa Economic Development Authority, Travel Mm -hmm. Iowa, and we are offering two special agritourism entrepreneurship business education tours. The deadline for registration for the first one is actually next week, and then we're doing another one in July. Hmm. And if you want to know more information about that, you can just do a browser search for Agritourism Entrepreneurship Tour, Iowa State University. And if you see a picture of a cow pop up on the web, that's you're at the right place. (laughs) But these are pretty cool because I am not aware of any other opportunity 
anywhere in Iowa or anywhere else where for $10 you can go to the world-class agritourism operators in Iowa, do the experience as you would as, as a public visitor coming onto their farm, mm -hmm. and then sit down and say, tell me the mistakes you made so that I won't have to do them. So it's direct one-on-one -on -one advice, personal assistance, and it's really a unique opportunity for anyone interested who is currently an agritourism operator and wants to improve or expand, or someone just thinking about that, what would it take to be successful? So you're making me think, as we go on tours like that, every time we go to a show, guys, we build relationships. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking of relationships, um, made me think of my father-in-law. So his agritourism is he sells freezer, free, freezer beef. And everybody I know that has cattle now sells butcher beef somewhere to somebody. Mm -hmm. But he has relationships with a ton of clients out there that he already has established. And then I'm thinking of another guy I know in Missouri that decided he was going to make his own locker. So he did. And now he's having a hard time getting into high V's or getting into fairways because the big corporations, JBS, et cetera, they don't want the little guy in there. Is there, is there a love-hate relationship with agritourism and agriculture? I, and from my perspective, I've seen a lot of cooperative partnerships. You mentioned local grocery stores, Iowa-based grocery stores, have in, historically been very supportive of Iowa producers and okay. try, to, try to include their products. But what I'm seeing as a new trend that I'm pretty excited about is more and more I see agritourism operators are partnering together with each mm. other to cross-promote their products. And what's really cool, they're creating some really unusual new products. For example, in Northeast Iowa, the Great River Maple Company create, does their own maple syrup tapping and their own syrup. And they have partnered with Mississippi River Distilling Company in LeClaire, who has spirits. So they use the spent bourbon barrels for, to age their maple syrup, and now they sell maple bourbon syrup. Oh, wow. And that sounds li good. likewise, the distillery uses a syrup, infuses their whiskey with a syrup, and then they have maple bourbon bottles. And it was just a seasonal product to try, and it became so popular, it's now a full time you product. Didn't bring us any? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and then to add to that, hearing that in Pella, there's a restaurant called brew house um, butcher's brew house yeah. downtown pella and now they take the maple and they infuse it into their cheesecake and they have the maple syrup cheesecake so they all cross and they list on the menu where these products are from right so they cross promote each other so they benefit but i think the people who benefit the most are us as consumers as iowans we get all these really cool new products what's the uh, we not we are local that's channel 5 news it's something <laughs> iowa local over here at double dipped oh yeah you got some oh, stuff yeah. there you got west 40 meets in in ankeny i mean you got yeah, a lot of different stuff that's collaboration the, I, they there was like a whole business and they just let all the yeah they own the space and almost every product in there is produced and provided by somebody else. That's probably what I'm most excited about is that Iowa agritourism operators support each other. They don't see each other as competitors. They see each other as we need to work together to promote who we are. Hmm. How about a podcast under the tourism? The ag podcast, right? It could be yeah. a stop on the deal. It there you go. Right there, live I recording. love it. Would love that. There we go. That's While right. you eat lunch. That's right. And you can give you a and, spot to sit. And you'll like this, Corey. The stop at the agritourism farm is an all aronia <laughs> berry lunch. Ooh. All things, wow. everything, everything from the salsa made out of aronia yeah. berries to to the aronia berry barbecue pork. Oh yeah, that's good. To the wine that we're yep. going to be wine sampling of aronia berry. Very good. You know, I'm, I'm just picturing it now. We're going to put two cots in the corner of the studio. <laughs> And bed and breakfast. It's a bed and breakfast. You go to bed recording a podcast. You wake up to a recording of the podcast and some fresh eggs and bacon. <laughs> there you go. Just hear it says, you can hear it now, can't you, Dave? I can. Okay, let's get back on. We got to get back into this. Okay, so our listeners know that uh, you got to be ready for a company. And I hadn't yes. thought about that. But just when you described it, just like Corey said, the scrap metal pile needs to get hauled away. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting there the same thing going, I know that there's two roller doors that are off the track that we haven't used in forever yeah. and whatever else you want to hide. But what, what are some other things that you see uh, agritourism companies do well 
that might be something our listeners can incorporate in their dream? Many people, when they want to start a new agritourism business, they have a grand vision. And they want to get to the vision before they take the steps to get there. Mm -hmm. You need to start small and start incrementally. You need to do small things very well so that you get the great reviews, you get the visitors who will tell other people about you, come back and bring more people who will tell even more people about you, and then as that grows, you can add to the next step. Right. So you need a business plan, you need a marketing plan, but start small and then grow incrementally as your business needs Then hopefully allow. you don't need the banker. Yeah. You can self-fund right. it. That's right. Right. That'd be hard for me. I'm thinking big vision. I, it, like when I think of yeah. uh, the agritourism, more of the pumpkin patches that I've been to, granted they've added a new attraction right. every year, but still have the grand scheme of, okay, I got to make money over here. I got to do this. I need employees. I need this. I need, I mean, I'm thinking big picture, not necessarily. Is there a certain archetype of person that, isn't a big picture. Like, I'm always thinking big, not the details. You know, that's my wife's job. <laughs> Most agritourism operators have a vision, and they have a creative idea of how to get there. The hard part is to limit themselves to just start small mm -hmm. and do it very well. The last thing you want to do is to do all things at once and have bad reviews, and that is not going to yeah. go well for your business. I don't know if you and I would be very good at it, Dave. Because we both of yep. us would want to. Yep. I got thirty acres here. All thirty acres. All gonna thirty be acres. Not, not <laughs> five. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you're like I've got lavender here, yeah. sunflowers here. I'm gonna here. do this. We're gonna make millions. Marigold. <laughs> so That's right. now I have a million dollar question. I'm thinking my wife, she goes out and pets cows every day. We are gonna start a business where you get to pet cows. Like <laughs> go with my wife. You talked about passion. She's got all the peas. This is perfect. So yeah, she's if, perfect. There's a fourth piece. If, if we can, if we can get somebody to pet cows, how much do I charge? How do we know how much to charge agritourism? I think this is worthless, but I bet you you have a metric Whatever for that. Whatever you pay. Whatever they pay. <laughs> you can go online and do your own research on who in your neighborhood, who in your neighboring state, who in similar businesses, what they charge, and see. You can test the market and see if that works for you. If not, you can tweak your own price points. But I want to go back to what you said, pet a cow. That's not just a joke. I actually know who someone who is now doing something yeah. very similar. This I worked with a, a company. It's a dairy goat business, and mm -hmm. they would sell goat milk. And they expanded then to goat cheese, which they sold then to high-end restaurants in their local area. That then evolved to goat milk gelato, which they sold to food trucks mm. for specialty products. And then they started to doing the on-farm experiences, the tours for the explorers, the one who went to learn about mm -hmm. the education about. And then they would teach people, you would pay to learn to milk a goat. And they had a station there and you could milk a goat and get selfies and do lots of cool things. That then evolved into baby goat yoga. So you do yoga. It. You knew yoga was I coming. I knew it was coming. Picture. I was like, when is goat yoga coming? <laughs> and <laughs> now she expanded even more and now you can do goat hikes. You rent a goat because goat goats are comic relief. So how much fun, How what a, what a stress breaker than to go on a hike with a goat. Oh, it sounds terrible. <laughs> Does the goat just follow you, or do you have like a, a lead the rope? Goats, the goats love people, and these goats are what, the kind that would just stick right close by. No, I, I don't. I don't want to go hiking by myself, let alone have to worry about a goat on a hike. We need well, to. You're not the adventure seeker. That's right. I'm not. Yeah, I didn't fall into that. We, we need to pet the mullet on the Farm for Profit <laughs> podcast. <Jeez. laughs> don't. Corey's going to be. Corey's going to be sitting there on a square yeah. bale. You're not going to be able to do cow yoga, Dave. Yeah. yeah. No, oh, okay. that's right. <laughs> that's right. A little too big. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, so this is the first time that we are incorporating Chat GPT into one of our episodes. So I didn't know a lot about agritourism before we put this together, requested by a lot of our listeners. So I asked ChatGPT, AI, what are some things we need to be concerned about when starting a business? And uh, the response back from it, correct? We, mm -hmm. don't have an, we don't have a gender to associate with AI. Yeah. Agritourism businesses can be costly to start and operate. The expenses are often overlooked. Here are some examples. So just like you said, most people have grand visions. Exactly. And there's a cost associated with it. Maybe that's how we get to how much we have to charge yep. because we look at how much it costs. So it just gave me 10 things to think about 
We already talked about permits and licensing. You talked about how they can get the resource mm-hmm. and, and check out different there. Same thing with liability insurance. So mm-hmm. permits, licensing, one. Liability insurance, two. Infrastructure was three. You talked about that. Don't feed me where your chickens poop. Exactly. Yep. Marketing and advertising. So we haven't talked about that a lot yet. So I'll stop here and kind of give you a, the floor what are agritourism successful ones doing for marketing and advertising? Well, social media is a must, and that's a given. However, how do you decide what platform? Mm. If you identify your customer base, and we talked about the five different categories, then you define your social media platform according to are. where they are, and that's yes. where you go. Hmm. And maybe they are the type of people who also visit certain kinds of places, and that's where also where you can target your marketing. And maybe they are the type that do the the passports. Travel Iowa has several agritourism passports that you may just want to go and pick up that idea. I'm not suggesting that you need to do it at the statewide level, Mm -hmm. but just with your local chamber and your and your visitor bureau, they are always looking for more reasons to advertise of how can they attract visitors to the door with unique experiences. Agritourism offers that to them. You can create a passport program with maybe with prizes with not just only other agritourism businesses, with other retailers in your community and just make it another stop on your community Hmm. passport. That's a good idea. Yeah, I didn't think about a chamber membership being valuable on that side of it locally. Because it's probably easier to get somebody to come just a couple miles than it is to get someone to come from states away mm-hmm. until you really get that, that grown up there. Well, AI kept going on and talked about maintenance and upkeep. Mm-hmm. We talked the same thing, making sure that you have a good impression. Employee training. You kind of touched on that a little bit when you, you mentioned three Ps. Because if I, didn't have, if I didn't have all three Ps, I might have the passion, but I certainly don't have the personality. Mm-hmm. I probably need to train some employees to do what I think needs to be done. Exactly. And um, we work with other state extension systems, other state university extension systems. Ohio State University is well known for their training program for employees of risk management and how to deal with public. And that link is on the Visit Iowa website with Iowa State University, so you can go directly to that and check that. So this is something, everything from emergency responses to first aid to how to prevent things from happening. It's all across the board, even hand-washing stations after a petting zoo. All of these things you don't immediately think of, but they're a checklist that you really need to be aware of and figure out how will this work on my site. Right. That ain't the real experience. You're not going to wash your hands after the cow craps on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got your pans for us. I bet Go straight to your these categories lunchbox. people do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then uh, AI continued to go down the line. Talk legal fees, obviously mm-hmm. forming a company, making sure that you've got an attorney to review contracts, mm-hmm. to overnight stays, taxes. Now, I know when we stay at a hotel for a, a conference, oh, there's yeah. a hotel tax. Lots of taxes. There's all kinds of yeah, serviced your room tax or whatever it is. <laughs> is is there? Different taxes for agritourism? That is dependent by the region, the county, the city that you're located in, the local hotel motel tax. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I wondered. I didn't, I hadn't thought about that. So thanks to AI for, for popping this I hadn't thought about this last one. That's crazy. Yeah. So the second to last one was accessibility. So, or accessibility, you know, the handrails near a toilet, the making sure you have a ramp if you wanted to be handicap accessible. You don't have to be, Correct. It depends on the size Again, of the operation, the thing. type of thing that you have. Yeah. Would this be considered commercial, or does it stay under ag, do you think? Probably size again. Again, and, and, and not just the size, the categories, even lodging. There are different grades of right. lodging of what you must meet for yeah, regulations. Because county could throw some fits at you if you sure. get zoned wrong. There are zoning issues. Again, this is all very localized yep. on on policies. It just goes to the importance of this isn't something you start tomorrow because you had the idea today. Exactly. It's a process to get through it. But Dave, what was the last one that caught your eye? Emergency planning. Like what if a tornado? Yeah. A derecho. Yeah. Never yeah. never would have thought nature. about that. Probably have to have a shelter mm-hmm. close by if you're going to have quite a few people. In fact, um, the Ohio State University extension that I mentioned, that lick that list, that link I mentioned, it has um, 
an employee plan so that every employee knows what to do, not only in case of a weather emergency, in case of a fire, that they need to know where to call and tell the fire emergency response individuals what gate to come into or what street or which address to use so to make sure that they can access not where they'll run into the number of visitors. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now I think I want to spend the next five or ten minutes for the listeners just kind of giving examples of businesses, agritourism ideas that already exist, you know, because maybe they're the three Ps Mm -hmm. and don't have the idea yet. You know, they know they've got a lot of different passions, but how do we go about that? So. I've got a couple on the sheet here, but be thinking about other ones that you're aware of. Obviously, Diane, you're going to have a wealth of list of businesses that are active and working because of you being directly in the industry. But we we talked about a couple of them already, pumpkin patches, Mm -hmm. right? We've all drug our kids. Our wives have drug us and our Mm -hmm. children to the pumpkin patch. And like I said, Black's, the one that we have locally. Center Grove, yep. Or Center Center Mm -hmm. Grove uh, has uh, pumpkin picking. An apple orchard. They've got a little train you can ride on. They've got a corn pit. It's just mm-hmm. regular number two corn that kids yeah. swim in. Yeah, they have a slide in it. Yep, made a, made a, they made a slide out of giant culverts that yeah, you can they, go down on a burlap sack. Yep. Big jump pad. Big jump pad. Mm-hmm. They do uh, rotten apple shooting. So yep. they take yeah. the bad apples and put them in a slingshot. Hay rack rides. Hay rack rides. Yeah. Um, of course, they sell the uh, end product of yeah, pumpkins they got and mark them up. Yeah, a lot. Oh, they and got the, pump, and they got uh, baked goods. That's true. Yep. And yep. food there, jellies and jams and credit card processing fees. That <laughs> they, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that they pass along. Might pass along and collect. So we know we know of that. I call that to me. That's the standard. That's the standard agritourism. It's it's the fall. It's a classic. Gotcha mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What else can you guys think of? I've kind of already gave in mind rose farms that mm-hmm. ice deal. Um, Trying to think of some others. Well, I like the. I, go ahead. I sold an apple orchard, and the apple orchard had that experience as well. Go pick your own apples. So yeah. I think it's any product that you go and experience picking of your deal. Even winery I've had where you go out to wine vineyards and do that, and then they, they don't process the wine, but then you go back. To, and, yeah. Yep. Oh, well, we, I forgot about our interview with Grant Wells. Um, his wife has you pick strawberries right mm-hmm. that they they grow with their their special technologies what are some as we think longer that you've got as examples then well i think you referred to wineries there are over a hundred wineries in iowa i think the last time i checked there were 118 wineries in iowa mm-hmm. and it's still a growing industry but of course they've now expanded into classes into food pairings into pizza nights and another growing part of the spirits are the breweries, the craft breweries, and the distilleries. So food and beverage is huge. Local foods is huge. So especially now, especially after COVID, people became reintroduced to make your own kind of food. And they they appreciate making things with their own natural ingredients and knowing where the food comes from. So anything that incorporates food and beverage, you get a lot of people's attention. And then if you can provide that in a unique setting that offers selfies and social media right. posts then you just you're really yeah. marketing up to another audience yeah earlier we talked about dairies that involve creameries and have products mm-hmm. on the farm you mentioned the experience of, of being able to go milk whether it's a goat or a cow right well if you want to talk about a new experience the new day dairy up by clarksville you can sleep with the cows literally <laughs> except at least it's the barn and of course um it's it's a robotic dairy which round round the clock, the cows are milked by the robots, but then they have a room addition, two levels with giant picture windows. So it's an Airbnb and you can go and stay overnight and you can um, mark your cow, pick your cow. And at any time of the day, you can watch your cow, whether your cow is sleeping, being milked, eating, that kind of thing. And the next morning you get a personal tour by the farmer to meet your cow, pet your cow, and as you mentioned earlier, Corey, for an additional fee, you can help do the chores. Huh. So is there any, we've had maybe some social media influencers that have done this, but like uh, name your corn plant? Yeah, wasn't like virtual there, agritours. Wasn't, wasn't there was that, somebody was that, that was... Aaron Holbert? Or no, was that no, Zoe? Uh, no, it was, uh, oh, it was Nebraska. Laura. Laura Farms. Laura Farms. She would like name... People were buying stuff for one corn plant. 
They named it. They, and she they would give them updates on it. And, and give them updates on where it was and pictures. And I'm like, really? They wanted to watch it grow. Absolutely. Well, I mentioned uh, Mississippi River Distillery mm-hmm. in Leclerc. All of their products are made from grain grilled by farmers within 50 miles of the distillery. And then they have small batches and they would label, they would bottle and label with a number. And then when you buy your product ticket home, you could go on the site and see the name of the farmer who produced the grain that is in the bottle of what you're Mm -hmm. drinking. So people do love that connection with Iowa, with farmers. What about even um, Christmas trees? Go, go pick your Christmas tree. I mean, that's kind of agriculture, and and it it's agriculture. it's it's an experience to go out, sleigh ride, pictures, family yep. pictures. They've kind of set up even out here. Um, trying to think of the name here, Strotman. Strotman's. It's not just get a Christmas tree. It's go have a whole. Event. What I love about the Christmas tree farms is you know they all go and you pick your tree out, and then they trim off the branches at the bottom for you. That's what they make into their garland and their wreaths. They're all throwing that away oh, yeah. because I tried to throw the extra pieces just in my truck. Like, hey, that's the tree I picked. I'm going to take the branches from it. No, 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 no. Let's go right into making the wreaths you and the garland. just doubled that tree's money. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Value added. We, we also have one uh, here locally, Living History Farms. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. using the history side of agriculture and offering a different and educational experience. An educational experience, yes. Yeah. Well, another one I can think Avenue of Breeds at the Iowa State Fair. So for the people that don't know to go to the hog barn or go to the, you know, there's a whole Avenue of Breeds put on, I think it's the FFA that puts it on, and they have a breed of every animal that's there. So a petting zoo. It's basically. Mm-hmm. They've even got it virtual, or not virtual. They do have virtual, but they've got it so, like, pigs are having babies and stuff mm-hmm. like while they're there. Because mm-hmm. North Polk used to take care of the Avenue of Breeds when it was on the south side of the fairgrounds. Mm-hmm. And we never had babies, but now it's up on the north side. Well, and, and then on crazy. the north side, they have the, it's the birthing. Yeah, the birthing, birthing or maybe barn. maybe that, yeah. That, that, they have yeah. the birthing barn now on the north yep. north end of the fairgrounds. And that attracts a ton of oh, people. Man. So, uh, again, getting some support from AI. The list that we got that we haven't already mentioned, AI talked about, like you mentioned, was farm-to-table dinners. So mm-hmm. that eating experience mm-hmm. in a unique setting. Ag education and workshops. We've already talked about that. Farm stays, a mm-hmm. lot of unique ways to do that, whether it's in a grain bin next to a, a dairy parlor, mm-hmm. the attic of your house, mm-hmm. in a barn, uh, harvest host, park a camper. Glamping. Yep. Glamping. Yep. <laughs> I, th- I think of that. That's, uh, what, that's what I think what Dave would do if he went camping. <laughs> Glamping. <laughs> yeah. No, mine is go meet random people. Remember uh, when I met, uh, um, I can't even think of the name, uh, in Idaho, um, when I went out and just uh, met them on TikTok and oh. visited their farm, and they put me up in one oh, of their that's a, uh, um, ranch. Yes, uh, I can't think of it. But anyways, ranch. in Idaho, I went out and visited their ranch, and we just took met his, him randomly. Took his wife out there. We did the interview for oh, it. Oh, oh, uh, Cheyenne. World of Cheyenne. Yeah, World yes. of Ag. Cheyenne, I, I think that's an experience. That was just, Idaho? I thought it was Colorado. It's Idaho. Pick a random spot and just go. Like if you just pick an airport and say, we're flying here today. That's an experience. Agritourism and adventure was another one that, uh-huh. that AI put out. Uh, the glamping is one that's on their list. Art. I didn't even think about that. That one, it, actually, they, they hit one that's really become popular right now. I'm working with another client who has, you pick flowers, you pick gardens, but now she's doing classes, plein air painting, which is simply painting out in the open air. And then they, you could come out and learn in nature how to paint and have a peaceful kind of thing. So art is very popular. I got an idea for you, Corey. Mm. You know how sometimes you can send prank gifts to your buddies? Mm-hmm. What you should have is you should host the prank agritourism location. So somebody <laughs> buys you, you're like, oh, thank you, and a Christmas present. They gave you a trip to Corey's farm, and literally they have to stay in a tent it's outside of your hog Giant barns. joke. <laughs> in your hog barns. I don't then, think I'd give very good reviews. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you get great reviews if it's the giver. <laughs> well, yeah. Not the getter. <laughs> I was really mad at my boss, so I sent him out to Corey's farm. <laughs> <laughs> So when I think of getting reviews, I think of giving stuff away. So we give a lot of stuff away to get the reviews, get people interested at first, and then they tell their friends, and then we they charge their friends for it. How much 
giveaways do you have to do? So I do charity auctions all the time. And there's a lot of people that give experiences away. Mm -hmm. As a real estate agent, I give uh, uh, gifts away afterwards that are a lot of times experiences. And then they go and, you know, you're recommended by somebody Mm -hmm. to go do this. They might not be the person that does it. How, How important are giveaways? I hear very little of that with agritourism. If you have a really creative, unique idea, it will sell itself. Really? Okay. I believe it. I mean, we're looking at all these things that we set listed off, and we would probably go do it, and we're in agriculture, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let alone somebody that's looking for that ag experience that mm-hmm. doesn't get it. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, excuse me, no. no, now, and now it's really capturing the world audience. Um, I have a, a farmer I work with near the Quad Cities, and he works with John Deere, and of course they have people come from all over the world to the corporate headquarters in the Quad Cities, and they were looking for how can we show our equipment in a real life setting. So he is paid, that's a corporate partnership, he is paid by John Deere to host these people and teach more about Iowa agriculture. And then that expanded into other corporate connections so Viking River Cruises, you may have heard of, they are now on the Mississippi River. So each week, they have another world audience comes, and they come onto this Iowa farm and learn about Iowa agriculture. So we are actually, we're teaching the world through agritourism about what we offer here in Iowa. Hmm. That's, that's Now great. they just need to set up on barges, because they're going up and down. Like, you could have, like, a couple <laughs> uh, shipping containers that are set up. Yeah. <laughs> you could just go with the beans down the river. <laughs> That's that's really have funny. little stops along the way. <laughs> Ports have called muscatine. Yeah, there yes. you go. <laughs> I like that. You got to fly into yeah. You got to fly into the northern point, and you fly out of some place further down the river. And depending and eventually, upon, you'll get to China. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're to tour China. Four month vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think any of this started? I'm thinking of Mike Rowe and Dirty Jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, he wanted to show the world what the world did, you know, what, all the dirty jobs. And I think a lot of people, I mean, it was a fantastic popular show. Is it, uh, even dirty agriculture? I mean, is it that people want to see the stuff they don't get to normally see every day? I haven't heard of that angle, but if you want to try it, I'll come and visit you if you want to, <laughs> if you want to try that one. But I think people are really curious. How is their food prepared? Is it the rumors I hear about? And what does it take what does it really take to produce what I buy in the grocery store? Right. And they really want experiences for their kids. They want their kids to learn about what it is that where their food comes from. Even people who live in Iowa all their life, many of them have never had yeah. the chance to actually see it in person. Hmm. Okay, so now as we get close to the end of the episode, we touched on a lot of things, and we didn't really go much in order for how things should be done. What do we miss? What, do, what should our listeners know before we wrap up? I think you need to plan your succession planning for your for your operation like any operation. Sometimes operators know everything and they need to share the knowledge. And some of them are doing that with their own families or with other operators. And that's something that's one of the reasons that we had people agree to do this tour that we're going to be offering because they feel like this is something that we need to continue on. Some of them were pioneers in different segments of agritourism and we need to share the share the news. We need to let the world know that Iowa has an amazing resource in our national resources and we're doing it very well. And this is something that we just need to educate the world about Iowa and what we have here. I love that. I've got an extra one bonus question that I always do. So say it's five, 10 years from now, what is a sneaky agritourism thing that we wouldn't think about today? What do you think is going to be there? Wow, Corey, that's hard because what we're doing now, I would never have anticipated. I know. So, like, I got to pick. It's like there's one person <laughs> doing this, and I think it might take off. Food will food will always be a theme. So, if you can do food and drink in a creative, unique way, you will always have a market because food is a universal. Everyone eats and drinks, and they would like to see what's the next cool, new, delicious way to have that happen. Well, five years from now, you won't be driving tractors, so it'll, we'll have to like show people what it's like to be in a tractor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Come drive a tractor. Come drive this a tractor. This is an antique 2020 model. <laughs> this is a 2020 model. You actually had to turn the wheel. The GPS and technology yeah. is, is, is an agritourism area mm-hmm. that a lot of people have no idea about the monitors and about uh, the, the 
going through the fields, how it's monitoring the harvest and the re recording well, that. And that's what I was so saying about corn maze, but they right. have to program it into the monitor that's somehow. Right. <laughs> it drives it through. Right. <laughs> I love the idea of you got to come plant five acres. You take a 160-acre field, divide that by five, <laughs> and you just each day plant five acres. You may never get a crop off of it, yeah. but if you charge enough for them to come plant it, and then you got to spray it, and then you get to... You could and then you get John Deere to test their stuff on it. Yes. So then they're just paying you to do that. You, think you, get crop <laughs> you don't even care if you harvest it. Could you get crop insurance on that, though, too, and double that? Oh, I mean, it was planted. <laughs> I, I never did say planted they planted it right. Times. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, that's good. Well, Diane, this has been a pleasure. We, let, we don't let off all of our guests easy. So we ask everybody the same questions. So we can put a pool of answers together in a recap show. So the question that you get to fall into is what advice would you give to yourself back at age 18 or to someone who's listening now who's in that same age range? So think about that and try not to get distracted by my summary of today's show. And it doesn't have to be anything agritourism. It's just okay. what is something just that you tell yourself. For someone, because we've learned we've got a lot of young listeners. Mm -hmm. So we talk to a bunch of experts and people full of life lessons. So what would you go back and tell yourself at 18? Corey, you get to challenge people today. Okay. I'll go through with our summary. So we talked agritourism. We again had uh, Diane Van Weingarten, which is an agritourism destination mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. uh, here from Iowa State University Extension to give us a lot of really great perspective. Uh, the things that I wrote down is you come up with your idea, but then you got to think about your target audience. Who's going to enjoy your idea? And we got five categories. The explorers, the experienced people, the ones looking for fun, facilitators, the ones I even thought of, uh, like my wife's company does corporate retreats. Mm -hmm. So she has to plan where they're going to go, if they're going to paintball or if they're going to go someplace. And then you have the hobbyists, which could be future promoters and volunteers. You have rechargers, which is uh, all of those people that started to work from Airbnbs during COVID uh, to get away from the city. Think about every piece of your farm, but know that there's resources. Visit Iowa Farms, the Iowa State uh, University Extension's website for the state of Iowa, uh, has risk management tools, uh, has connections to insurance, has other resources for those that are looking at getting started. But one of the key things is you gotta reflect and be honest on who you are as a person. Because we got three Ps that matter. Mm -hmm. Passion, personality, and perseverance. If you don't have those three, you need to find people that have something that you don't have in order to be successful. Think about it. Try to have an independent approach when you look around your place of agritourism. And are you really ready for company? Are you really ready for somebody that's not your mom and dad, not your brother and sister, mm -hmm. to come in here and not be ashamed for a word, not be embarrassed or disgraced uh, to come hang out? And then as you dive into this, do small things very well first, create a various forms of revenue, whether that's education, through sales of products, through events, hosting uh, experiences, and then look around you at others that are in agritourism for a partner, and maybe you can help cross promote. So that's my summary for today. How did I do? Very well. Okay. It's your time to hey. shine. What would you tell yourself back at age 18? I would just keep it very simple that Consider your work ethic. Everything that your parents told you you had to do, you did not want to do, you now know how to do. You can learn things, you can get degrees, you can get classes, you can get experience, but you need that innate work ethic uh -huh. to carry through. That's a good Follow answer. your dream. Good. That's a good answer. Corey, what are you going to do to send our listeners off? My challenge, challenge is uh, you know, we are centered around profit and we are looking at possibly some going down times and profitability in, in agriculture and commodities. And we always talk about do, or I always talk about do more with what you have instead of just more acres or whatever. So I would just say, you know, look into some possibilities in your area. Are you around a, a populated area that could, do you, do you have a pumpkin patch or do you, do you have a winery? Do you have some of that? What's your passion? Could you, could you bring something onto your farm to help uh, diversify? I love that. I love that. Diane, this was a pleasure. Likewise. Having never met you, thanks to uh, the power of Google for connecting us. 
Uh, thank you again for hanging out. And listeners, we appreciate everything that you do. If you like this show, please share it with one of your friends, your family members. Uh, but until next time, have a good one. Mm-hmm.